Okay, so specifically I'll be talking about um, <clears throat> fractionated uh, CO2 laser resurfacing uh, in my experience with this in Pittsburgh. So, you know, I've purchased a number of different uh, machines, you know, laser rejuvenation machines. And uh, like so many things in life, there's a bit of a spectrum. Uh, some of them I'm uh, really very happy with. And this is, this is the single best uh, sort of, the machine that's the base of this talk that several other people in this room own is the best machine I've ever purchased. Um, I have others that I'm happy with, but I have a few that I'm less happy with. So here we go. No disclosures, uh, presentation contents. We're gonna talk a little bit about <coughs> um, conventional meaning non-fractionated CO2 uh, resurfacing and, and why that has largely gone away, some of the indications uh, for this procedure, what is fractionation exactly, how does it work, uh, some of the basics of patient selection, anesthesia, uh, post-laser care complications, and then a couple of examples that myself and some of my colleagues have um, produced. Okay, so this is the machine. I, I, I receive not one cent nor any benefits, no uh, nothing of any kind. Um, from this company. Um, uh, this is Elman, which was recently acquired by a larger company, um, but, um, uh, but uh, it has two things on it. There's the uh, fractional CO2 scanner right here. There's this little pistol looking thing uh, strapped onto the side of this. This is an erbium YAG laser, uh, which we use in concert with the fractional CO2 laser, I'd say 85% of the time, and we like the fact that we can combine those procedures together, but I'm not going to emphasize that hardly at all because that was not what I was asked to speak about. Um, conventional resurfacing limitations. So back in the mid-90s, late 90s, this became quite popular. Um, where we were able to achieve sometimes quite stunning results uh, with uh, fully ablative, non-fractionated CO2 lasers. However, everybody in this room, I think, is aware of this history. Uh, the recovery was pretty arduous. Uh, many patients, a full two weeks of looking like heck. Okay, looking red. Red like Jill Hessler's shirt over there. Okay, but then, uh, even if it were just that, uh, but then months of sort of, you know, erythema, slowly diminishing erythema, and that's, um, that was too much. I think the market simply moved away from it. And then 2003, 2004, a whole host of uh, very non-ablative, not just IPL, but things like a Fraxel non-ablative, the 1540 handpiece on the Palomar uh, unit um, came out. I think patients certainly appreciated the much lower downtime. They could come in on Friday, uh, get their treatment, uh, and they went back to work as, a, as a whatever profession they were in on Monday, and they were pretty much good to go. Now, they had to come in sometimes a month apart, five or six times. I think it would have been fine. Uh, they liked the, the, the lesser imposition on their life, and they certainly lacked the lesser uh, degree of complications. Um, however, um, the problem was that sometimes, you know, eight months after that last treatment, and we had this experience, just you're not looking at much, uh, and patients absolutely don't like it after spending cumulative over those five or six treatments, a significant amount of downtime and, and money. And so, um, off late in, in, in the last five years or so, uh, fractional ablative treatments, specifically fractional CO2, has very much come into its own. And it's my personal opinion that this strikes a pretty healthy balance. I think patients and us, our communities, have been educated that you can't just kiss the skin with some sort of thing that's going to make you a little bit red for 48 hours or so. Even if you kiss the skin five times, separated by a month each time, and expect this enormous change, or any meaningful change. Uh, you know, what you're actually doing here, of course, is you're causing a controlled, benign, controlled sort of injury and you need to have some sort of recovery from that injury. So I think they fairly artfully struck this balance where you can have much less downtime, a much lower incidence of complications, though no, not zero incidence of complications, and get real results. Okay, common uses for fractionated CO2 laser systems. Again, I'll be fairly concise. We all sort of know what they are. It's sun damage, it's aging, aging skin, it's moderate wrinkling. This is, uh, this is the kind of patient, the average patient where I practice in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, might be in their late 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, we do not have an extraordinarily ethnically diverse population. Most uh, people in my part of the country are Caucasian. I have lots of Fitzpatrick 1, 2, and 3, so we have many candidates for this laser in our, in our practice. 
uh, some of the technical details, CO2 uh, spot size and pulse duration. So uh, the spot size uh, of 150 microns in this case, it's just what it sounds like. It's the spot, it's the size of that tiny beam of light coming down on the skin. The pulse duration is how long the light is on. All of these parameters, of course, can be manipulated um, in order to get a less or more intense uh, treatment. Fractional technology, the energy is delivered from the epidermis through the papillary dermis and poking into the reticular dermis. 100 to 750 microns. Each pulse of CO2 energy ablates not just the column of tissue, but then heat, heat um, uh, spreads out from those columns. And the idea is over a period of three months, four months, you get continued collagen contracture in response to that heat injury in the tissue that was not ablated. And so this is the idea. On the left, uh, we have the Erbium YAG handpiece that's attached to this machine. That's the depth. It's an ablative laser, too. Um, and that's the depth it goes to. But obviously, the fractional CO2 lasers penetrate much deeper. And this is the idea of what causes this de a degree of contracture. I do want to say one thing. We're very, uh, you know, some patients come in. We've talked a lot about, about surgical versus non-surgical. You know, they're saying, well, geez, I'll do the CO2 laser, and I'll get some lifting. You know, as soon as uh, a patient uses that vocabulary, I'm clear about the kind of lifting uh, that you can get from this. You can get some modest tightening over time, but we consider and we articulate to the patient that this is mostly a surface treatment. We're mostly trying to improve the, the uh, sort of the, uh, the, the quality of your skin. We're not really trying to lift anything with this because as you know, patients will take basic vocabulary and run with it in their own way. Geez, I can avoid a lift. Maybe I'll just do this. We tell them, no. Okay, the chemo for the target is water. So I'm going to go very briefly through this. This is the control panel on this device, but it explains certain concepts around this. So you can see the scan size. That's the size of the little quarter shape. You can adjust the shapes that is actually burned each time you pull the trigger. The duration is how long the light comes down. The density is within that size. Let's call it the size of a quarter. What percentage of that skin is actually ablated? You can go from very high. This would be 80%. I'd consider that high, 80 85%. Or you can go down to lower, 15%. We usually go intermediate, 35%. So the duration, pulse duration, amount of time the light is actually delivered into the skin, usually in milliseconds. So uh, the depth of the lateral heat, if, it's, if, it's, if the light goes down for a longer period of time, it doesn't necessarily penetrate deeper, but it's heating that core for longer, and the heat, the heat moves in lateral direction around those columns more so. And you could hope, you would like to think that you can get more contracture over time if you do a more aggressive treatment, in other words, a longer duration. Density is what I referred to earlier. Um, if, you, if you want a little bit of feathering, if you've been very aggressive on the cheeks and you want to feather into the neck, as you can see there, 13 to 17 percent. 20 to 35 percent is, is for mild to moderate wrinkles. That's 35 percent is probably the most common treatment in my practice. And we tend to lean a little conservative. We've never had a complication of significance with this laser, not even one. Uh, 50 to 70 percent, I know plenty of people who use that safely. I know people who routinely use 80 percent. I think if you did that consistently, eventually you're going to see a little bit of hypopigmentation here and there uh, if you don't pretreat patients and such. Okay, patient selection. Logically, everybody in this room understands you, you're looking at Fitzpatrick's skin type, you're looking at the severity of edge, uh, aging. At nexial density, has this patient had radiation therapy or something like that? Obviously, you need to ask about that. Patient expectations. We find our patients are, unlike some of the other devices we use in our practice, uh, which we basically don't use anymore, but we find overwhelmingly patients are happy. Having said that, we put a fair amount of time into managing patients' expectations. We, don't, we tell them we're not going to get this skin as smooth as a baby's bottom at all. We're, get, we're trying to get a meaningful, measurable, obvious, like the, their neighbor two doors down will look at them, and if they ask them about their skin, the neighbor will immediately sort of see it. Uh, we think we can deliver those results fairly uh, consistently. Patient selection, one through three, always great candidates. Four, be a little careful, some pretreatment. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, Fitzpatrick, five and six, uh, not in my practice. Everybody knows the Fitzpatrick scale. Patient considerations, look for, look for uh, important points in the medical history, psychological, physical, list of medications. Are they using uh, Accutane? Some people would say you have to be off for six months. Some people say 12 months. Uh, re uh, recent sun exposure, not just before the procedure, but after. We like people to have been very low intensity on the sun. It's not that we won't do this at all during the summer, but we slow down a lot during the summer. We do a lot more of this sort of from October you know, through maybe April. 
Uh, if it's in the summer, you better be fairly fair and you haven't been, you know, swinging a golf club in Florida or something like that. We want to know about history of herpes simplex uh, and infections, uh, their skin care regime, if they have a tattoo. Remember, CO2 lasers were one of the original lasers used to remove tattoos. So if they have a tattoo, you're not going to treat anywhere near it because you're going to damage the tattoo. Patients who should not be treated, pregnant, poor health, etc. I'm going to skip through this. It's fairly obvious, unrealistic expectations. I talked about expectations. They need to know that, uh, you know, uh, we are happy to. I remember talking to Devinder Mangat about two years ago, and he was telling me about how, as you know, he does, he's reduced chemical peels down to a science. He's very, very good at it. But like anybody who's done a lot, um, he'll tell you very plainly, compared to 20 years ago, he's much more conservative uh, because eventually you'll get into trouble. We want to stay well within the zone of safety with the use of lasers. And so we tell people, you know, we're going to get a good, you know, sort of 60, 70 percent improvement and we're happy to leave the rest on the table. If you want a little bit more, come back in two years, let's do it again. Anesthesia considerations. Um, most of our patients, we have a wonderful sort of topical uh, cream we put it on. Many of our patients just do that. Some patients are understandably a little bit nervous, so we use some Xanax or something like that. We typically don't do uh, facial blocks. You certainly could, but we typically don't do facial blocks, and we typically don't do oral pain medication. Uh, what to expect post-treatment? This, uh, this is the beauty. This is sort of the punchline of, of, of this sort of device. And this is, I think, uh, this, uh, what's been articulated here is pretty conservative. Uh, some people, they walk out of our office and they actually look pretty good. We tell them, though, they need to be patient because in about a day and a half, they'll look considerably worse. After a day and a half, they look like they've got the worst sunburn they've ever had. But we tell them, um, after you know, two and a half days, it's like a mild sunburn. After three and a half days, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, sorry, after two and, two and a half days, it's a moderate sunburn. Three and a half days, mild sunburn. Five days later, most of these patients, and there's some peeling and some flaking and some itching in between, but most of these patients five days later could go into their local grocery store and get off with it. You know, they might not want to go to a big social event, but most of our patients certainly by seven days later, they are up and at them. They can go back to their law firm and work. They can do what they need to do. If there's an intense social event going on, I think 10 or 11 days out, they had to go to a big a wedding or something like that, 10 or 11 days out, I would feel very comfortable that the vast majority can do that. And that's a whole different world to what we were dealing with in the late 90s. Post-treatment care, um, it's all about uh, using sort of the, uh, the moisture blocks. Uh, I won't go into too much detail on this, but we're very in touch with our patients. We have them uh, communicate pictures to us every single day for the first eight days, every single patient. We make sure they're taking care of their care appropriately with these various um, sort of lotions and potions. Complications, laser skin resurfing complications include, as I say, we have not had a single case of hypopigmentation. We haven't had... Um, We've had some protracted erythema. We've had people with some redness up to two weeks. We've had some people with edema up to about two weeks. Um, but we've certainly not had any preauricular or postauricular you know, necrosis or any significant hypopigmentation. We have had occasional hyperpigmentation, uh, which can be irritating, um, uh, but it goes away consistently. I think in those cases, we probably could have been a little bit more aggressive or selective with our pre-laser treatment, uh, but you know, it goes away. No. <laughs> Good point, Dr. Wong. No, I, I, we typically don't treat the post area. Um, let's see. This is just uh, sort of the expected things that what one would experience. Uh, patients feel intense heat for about uh, 70 minutes afterwards. We apply uh, uh, cooling, uh, when usually not ice cold, but, uh, but cooling, compresses and such. There's itching. Itching is a fairly common and consistent complaint. Some of these ointments invariably start to cause irritation of their own, and so you're sort of juggling these different ointments. Um, but all of these things, again, if you stay in regular communication with the patient, in regular contact with the patient, uh, it, it's, you don't even really have to manage it. You just need to inform them of what's going on and let them know that this is nothing to be concerned about. Like I said at the top of this uh, presentation, we very frequently combine the deeper penetrating fractional CO2 with the much more superficial erbium YAG. When you apply the erbium YAG on top of the fractional CO2 immediately afterwards, it's like polishing the skin. We find that our use of IPL has diminished in our practice because dyschromias and what have you, we can get substantial improvement such that it's difficult to cost justify doing IPL after this. What, uh, what we do find is some patients don't want any downtime in the hate of the dyschromias. Well, then, of course, IPL. Okay. 
similar points. Some results, fractional CO2 results here. Um, you can see the settings there. Um, here's a lady. I think the picture is sort of reasonably impressive. It's not overwhelmingly impressive what I'm showing here, but I can tell you. Uh, in person, the results are substantial. We hear this comment quite a bit. People who are in their late 40s, early 50s, who have been progressively, you know, um, uh, many people are wearing less and less makeup nowadays in, in Western Pennsylvania. They're not really doing the makeup. Uh, but then they slowly start to do so more so into their 40s, into their early 50s. I've heard half a dozen times, wow, geez, I, I don't wear hardly any makeup anymore after this treatment. And that's always music to our ears because people are doing that because they're seeing the irregularities, whether it's the fine wrinkles, the moderate wrinkles, or all of the sun damage. And if, uh, if, if you're not wearing makeup, it's because you're no longer worried about that. This is my buddy Sam Lamb. Uh, he just sent in this picture. I think this may be somebody in his office. So um, again, you know, I look at that at first blush compared to some of the surgical things we do. Um, it's not, you know, that it's not like it would, I would fall out of my chair if I saw one or the other walking towards me. But, um, but what we, I can tell you is I've seen consistent results. If we do 20 patients, 19 of them, they come into our office and they shoot us the thumbs up immediately. This was great. And uh, you know, we've, not, we've not always had that experience with our energy devices. And in my mind, uh, that's good. And you know, there's other elements to this particular device, no disposables. We like that. It's very durable and reliable. Thank you very much for your attention.